first of all, I love Geyer Springs. And you, are a people who have dearly blessed me and my family. And I'm not going to bore you with the long list of reasons why I love Geyer Springs and why you have blessed me and my family and are so dear to us. But I do want to share a couple with you. They are in the top five in no particular order. One of those are this group of men and women who are in front of you and behind me. Every Lord's Day, I look forward to them leading us to the throne of grace in spirit and in truth. Another one is you. It is your hunger for the Word of God. So the privileges that I have to fill the pulpit or sub in a Sunday school class or teach children or simply pass you in the hallway, your hunger for the truth is contagious and it is encouraging. There are many churches that we might call out of season churches to preach and teach the Word of God. The people there are resistant to the work of the Holy Spirit, working through His Word into their lives. But let me tell you something this morning, Geyer Springs is not one of those places. It is what I would call an in-season place to preach. You are a group of people who are hungry for the truth and want to know the truth. See, because here's the reality this morning, if we misinterpret this, we don't have the truth, so we must get it right. And thank you for being a people who want to get it right. So this morning, let's take our truth, let's open the book to Galatians 5, and let's get it right together. As you turn there, I'm reminded of a few years ago, Katie, Emily, and I, we went on a hike, and that's not something we do all the time, but it's something that we have done from time to time. And you'll know why in just a moment. Katie asked this question every time we go on a hike, but she said, sure, I'll go on a hike, but how far are we going? I said, five miles. She said, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. Five miles or less or your money back. She said, sure, we'll go. So we took off on this hike on this day, and it was a beautiful day, a lovely day. The sun was shining, the skies were clear, the view was beautiful, the air was fresh, and the best part of all was the company. And we're hiking along the trail, and we're going along our way, and we're a pretty good ways into this, and I'm trying to track it on my watch, and I look and I realize that we are just about at five miles, and we stop in the middle of the trail. Now on the outside, Katie acted like she didn't want to ask this question. Ladies, you know on the inside, you're chomping at the bits to ask this question. She says, are we lost? <laughs> We're lost, aren't we? I said, we're going to have to define lost. And she said, I tell you what, we just need to stop right here and turn around and go directly back to the car. We'll backtrack. We've already come this way. That will be about 10 miles and we'll be done. Now, Katie is very cautious, very risk adverse. She's not going to speak up. God puts people together for certain reasons. I am none of those things. And I said, we should push forward. We'll get there faster. Well, I won and lost the day because we did push forward. And after a few hours later, what I thought was going to be a five mile hike, by the time we got back to the car, I checked my watch and it was 13.4 miles. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a very long ride home that afternoon. <laughs> but I say that to say, because in all honesty and full disclosure this morning, that is often how I feel in my faith. I don't know about you, one day I feel like I am on track, I'm on the path, on the trail, I'm going the right direction, exactly where I need to be, I'm making good headway in time, and then the next I realize I am off course, off trail, and I don't know where the car is. There are days that I feel on fire for the Lord, and then the next day I am cold to the things of His Word. There are some days that I feel like I'm on the mountaintop with the Lord, communing with Him, and the next day I have slipped and fallen, and I am in the bottom of the valley, and I am prayerless. There are some days that I feel like a fresh flowing stream to the people of God, and there's other times I feel like a stagnant pond that has nothing to offer anyone around me. You ever feel that way? The Apostle Paul knew that each and every one of us would feel this way. So before we get to Galatians 5, let me read to you what he wrote from Romans chapter 7, verse 15. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Did you hear what Paul's saying here? He's saying, I don't want to do the bad things, but I find myself doing these things I don't want to do. 
And then he says, I really, really want to do the good. And I find myself struggling to do the good that I've been called to do. Do you feel that way? I do. And if the apostle Paul one of our heroes of the faith within the New Testament and the entirety of the scriptures felt that way. I think if we will come to a full disclosure of ourselves before the Lord this morning, I think we can admit that we feel that way too. So the question before us this morning is this, how do I become the faithful Christian where I am on track and on the trail more than I am off course and into the weeds? So I wanna invite you to stand with me this morning as we read Galatians chapter five, beginning in verse 16 through verse 26. I will tell you, as I studied this text this week and prayed through it and wrestled through it, it brought me to my knees several times. And I pray that it will do the same for each of us here today. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evidence, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. May God give us understanding and trust in his truth today. You may be seated. In looking at the faithful Christian, the first thing that I want to draw our attention to in this text today is that the faithful Christian, number one, consistently follows consistently follows. We see four phrases sprinkled throughout this text that reminds us the marks of the faithful Christian. Look at verse 16. It says the faithful Christian here is one who walks by the Spirit. Drop down to verse 18. The faithful Christian is one who is led by the Spirit. Look at verse 25. The faithful Christian is one who lives by the Spirit. And again in verse 25, the faithful Christian is one who keeps in step with the Spirit. So it's clear that the faithful Christian is one who consistently follows the Holy Spirit. Now, when we look here at the word walk in verse 16, it is written in the present tense imperative form in the Greek. So what that means is it could easily be translated instead of walk, keep on walking. It's a consistent, it's a continuous, it's an ongoing, regular, habitual action. And this is significant because the word walk here is how you're living your life. It is the decisions and choices and commitments that you and I make that define who we are today and who we're becoming as a person. Walking is an incredible metaphor of the Christian faith, isn't it? It's one that Paul used in other letters. And it's this walk that began when you came to the place where you put your trust, hope, and belief in Jesus Christ. You believed in who he said he was and is, and you believed in what he did for you on the cross of Calvary, how he was buried in the tomb and three days later arose from the grave. But it's more than that. It is the moment that you repented of your sins. Now, we think of the word repentance, we think of telling God, I'm sorry. We think of God coming to him and saying, oh, God, please forgive me. And that's all a part of repentance, but it's more than that. Literally, the word repent means to change your mind. It's a turnabout, 180 degrees. You are going this way and you turn and you're going this way. You change your mind about what you think about sin. You change your mind about who you think God is and how you feel about each of them. 
Not only that, it's this change of mind that leads to a change of heart, which ultimately leads to a change of action. So belief and faith followed by repentance, you're no longer walking by, led by, living by, keeping in step with the world. You're instead walking by, led by, living by, keeping in step with the Spirit. See, because it is at the point of salvation that every single believer receives the Holy Spirit to guide our walk. There are several verses in the New Testament that would indicate this to us. If you were to drop back a couple of chapters in Galatians to where we once were studying together, Galatians 3, 2, Paul asked this question. Did you receive the spirits by work of the did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? The answer here is implied. It was when you came to faith that you received the Holy Spirit. And here's the truth. The Spirit doesn't come to us in some later subsequent second blessing. When we come to faith in Christ, we don't get the Holy Spirit in installments. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we get the Spirit fully, all of Him that we will ever need to follow the Lord. Now hear this, the Holy Spirit just doesn't simply exist in our lives to do miraculous, mind-blowing, supernatural things. He is available to you and I as believers in the boring, mundane grind of life. Those big things and those small things. In John chapter 14, Jesus calls him the helper. The word here is paraclete, the one who would come beside us. And he is beside us in every aspect of our life. And at salvation, we receive all of him that we will ever need. But here's the catch. Even though we receive all of him that we will ever need to walk by him, he needs to receive more and more of us to do his best work. And as we relinquish more control of ourselves, here's what we're going to find. We find ourselves living the life of the faithful Christian. As we relinquish more control of ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves walking by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, living by the Spirit, and keeping in step with the Spirit. As I mentioned, walking, it's an incredible metaphor of the Christian faith. And it's when you walk that you're doing something really important. You're advancing. You're making forward progress. And you can say this with me. There are times in your life where you have made large strides for the Lord. There are other times that you've made small baby steps for the Lord. And there are some seasons where you're just in neutral. You are just stuck. But the more control that we give of ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the greater our walk is going to be. Now, let me say something. If you're here this morning and you claim to be walking, you claim to have come to Jesus Christ, and since that moment there has been no forward progress in your life, the truth is you may not have truly repented, changed your mind to have a change of heart, which would have led to a change of action, forward progress with the Lord. See, a true Christian is going to slip and fall. We're still going to sin. There are some denominations that teach a perfected sanctification. In other words, they would tell you that if you walk with the Lord in the right way, you'll get to the point where you don't sin anymore on this side of eternity. But that's not true. Every believer is still going to sin. And when you sin, you slip and you fall, you get off trail and off track, you find yourself in the weeds and turned around. But every believer will get back up, find the track and trail again, and begin making significant spiritual steps. I love what Dr. R.C. Sproul said. It's not the perfection of our faith, it's the progression of it. Let me ask you, in thinking about walking and consistently following the Lord this morning, are you progressing in your faith? I want to encourage you to write this phrase down, submit to the Spirit. This is where you're going to find victory to consistently follow Him. This is where you're going to find the progression of your faith. It's constantly submitting to the Spirit. It's not something that you just do at the first of the month and say, this month I'm going to submit to the Spirit, and then you go all month, and the beginning of the next month you commit to submit to the Spirit. It doesn't work that way. It is a daily act. It is a daily action where you find yourself all throughout the day submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what it means to walk by the Spirit. It's something we need every moment of our lives. So let me ask you, is there an area of your life right now in your heart of hearts, in your mind, that you have not submitted to the Holy Spirit? There's no better time than now to give control of that to Him so that you can forward progress in your walk. 
You see, verse 16 is a clear command, isn't it? Walk by the Spirit. But I want you to look at the rest of that phrase. It's also a command that comes with a very clear promise. If I walk by the Spirit, what will I not do? Do you see it there? You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So we saw, number one, the faithful Christian consistently follows. But number two, the faithful Christian also crucifies flesh. Verse 17 is very clear to us. The Christian life is not a playground. The Christian life is a battleground. And if this wasn't so, Paul would not have given us a section in Ephesians chapter 6 telling us all the armor, all the pieces of the armor of God. So what makes it so hard to be this faithful Christian? Well, the fact of the matter is there are three evil superpowers that exist. You could call them the unholy trinity, if you will. It is Satan and demons, it is the world, and it is our flesh. And here Paul is focusing on the flesh, beginning in verse 17. The word in the Greek is sarx, and it can mean a lot of different things, but Paul particularly here is referring to our sinful nature. I mean, think about this for a moment. If God picked you up today at this moment and transported you to a deserted island to live, now some of you are going, yes, Lord, that's what I've been praying for. Please, right now, do that. But if he did that and he barred Satan and the demons and the rest of the world from that island, do you realize that you are still going to struggle with sin? Do you know why? Because you showed up to that deserted island in flesh. I mean, think about this. When God destroyed every living being on the earth in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9 through the great flood, those eight people, Noah and his family, stepped off the ark. Did sin go away? Was it eradicated? Of course not. Because when they got off the boat, where was sin? It was within them as it is within us. We are born into this iniquity. We bring it inside of us. But the good news is, is that when we get on the walk, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we believe, we repent. The Holy Spirit not only comes to indwell us, but he does something else very significant in our lives. He writes the law of God onto our hearts. So then it no longer just becomes a duty to get on this walk in this path. It becomes our desire to follow him. And in turn, it becomes our delight. And this is the conflict that every redeemed soul has. You have been saved by grace and been made brand new, but you are still stuck here in a body and a mind and a will and emotions that are subject to a sinful nature. See, when we're saved, we enter these three processes. And we've talked about these throughout Galatians, and they correspond well with three other things that we've talked about throughout Galatians. But it's justification, sanctification, and glorification. And each of those correspond with the penalty and the power and the presence of sin. Now, we won't have time to break down all of those, but they're really important to understanding this idea of crucifying flesh so that we can become the faithful Christian that God has called us to be. Now, when we think about this idea of justification, there's a lot under that phrase, but simply put, justification, just as if I never sinned. That happens once in every believer. You are made right before God. He does not see our sinfulness. He sees the righteousness of Christ. The penalty of our sin, justification, the penalty of our sin is taken by Christ upon the cross. Now, if you were to fast forward to what's known as glorification, that's the day when we'll pass away or Christ will come back and get us. And we go into that eternal state. And at that moment, the presence of sin is gone. But where do we find ourselves now? in this limbo of justification and glorification, what's known as sanctification. And no believer has the option to get away from sanctification. No believer can opt out of sanctification. It is a required process. And it's this time that you begin to grow to love God more with all the spirit he's given you and hate sin more. And even though the penalty of sin is gone, we're still very much in its presence, aren't we? And us walking by the Spirit, crucifying the flesh, here's what we're seeking to do, to have victory over the power of sin in our lives. Now, verse 17 tells us something about the Spirit and the flesh. Look at that with me. They are what against each other? They are opposed to each other. 
There exists within every Christian a war of the spirit and the flesh. We are walking battlegrounds. See, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, this is when this war begins. It's like the spirit of God conquers your heart. And within your heart is the capital city and the throne in which the spirit sits to rule and reign. But the enemy has not been eradicated from the city. The flesh is still out there coming into the city to attack it at weak points with guerrilla warfare, seeking to get your attention off the one who is sitting on the throne. Warren Wiersbe, in a commentary on Galatians, particularly within this passage, he illustrates the spirit and the flesh by comparing them to animals. Listen to what he writes. Wiersbe illustrates the spirit and flesh by saying, sheep is a clean animal and avoids garbage, while pig is an unclean animal and enjoys wallowing in filth. Our old nature is like a pig, always looking for something unclean on which to feed. Our new nature is like a sheep yearning for that which is clean and holy. No wonder a struggle goes on in the life of a believer. Do you feel that? The sheep and the pig within your soul and you're battling in the midst of that? Drop down and look at the first part of verse 19. Paul tells us that the works of the flesh are evident. Some of your scriptures may say the deeds of the flesh are evident. And in verses 19 through 21, Paul gives us 15 different sins that are listed here that come out of the flesh. Even in verse 26, if you drop down, you could see three more added to this list. Now here in verse 21, Paul says things like these in such things when he's talking about all of these sins. Now he's indicating to us with those phrases that there are way more sins that you and I can commit and do commit that are not on this list. So it's not an all-inclusive list. And so we don't have time to get into the weeds of this, but it's important for us to see in these verses that these sins are categories in our life. They represent ways in which we sin in the different areas of our life. In the first category, we could call that physical. Look at verse 19. We see these sexual sins clearly on display. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. These sins are absolutely everywhere today. Things like adultery and transgenderism and pornography and homosexuality and fornication and various others. And let me just tell you on a sidebar, they're coming at our children with this stuff. And if you don't believe that, I'm going to tell you to open your eyes wide and to gird up your loins and to stand firm and protect your home. They're trying to normalize this sinful, this illicit and disgusting behavior in our society. This past week, in speaking to a group of Baptists in Anaheim, California, Dr. John MacArthur said this, Our nation spends one day, Memorial Day, to remember all who have died that we may have freedom, and then spends the next 30 days celebrating LGBT perversion. He's exactly right, isn't he? And what a sad state today we find our nation in. And we must recognize those sins out there and we must speak biblically to them and call them for what they are. But let me tell you something, as we fight with one hand, we must be guarding our heart with the other. Because as the world has been steeped into these sins, they can easily capture our hearts as well. We must guard against the flesh physically, sexually. But secondly, Paul notes these sins are also in spiritual categories. Look at verse 20. He lists idolatry and sorcery. This could include things like the occult and witchcraft and many other things, but it's broader than that. Now, when we hear that, you may be like me and go, oh, I would never do that. But I want you to, tell, I want you to hear this. We all create gods in our own image, in our own liking, out of about anything. I mean, today, things that are just normalized in our society have become gods for people. Psychology, pragmatism, science, wokeness, the government. People are making these things into gods. And what do I mean by that? They're allowing these things to fuel their ideology and dictate how they live their lives. They're driving their lives by the tenets found in these things. But as we keep going, thirdly, Paul highlights some social sins, some relational sins. In verses 20 and 21, he says things like strife and rivalry and divisions and drunkenness. And there's so much packed into these phrases. But the point is, all of these sins in verses 20 and 21 that we see, they stir up resentment and bitterness and fighting and anger and hostility and hatred. They literally poison the well in our relationships with others. Every time we sin, it's like dropping a stone in the water. When you drop a stone in the water, the ripples begin to go on the surface of the water. 
Well, the bigger our sin, the bigger the stone. And the bigger the sin, the bigger the stone that hits the water, the farther the ripples are. Our sins have a direct impact on those that the Lord has put around us. Now, the facts of the matter is this. All of us in this room have broken some of these sins. You may go, I have not done all of these, and I believe you probably have not done all of these, and I probably haven't either. But you may say, since I haven't done them all, I haven't done what I think are the worst ones, I must be okay. But it's not just that. You're not okay. I'm not okay. We're not okay. If we had a large mirror up here today, and that mirror represented all 15 of these sins listed in the text here. And I were to take a hammer, and on the right side at the top, those were the sins that you and I broke, and I hit the mirror right there on that spot. Now, we didn't break the other sins that would be on the mirror, did we? But what's going to happen to the entirety of that mirror? It's all going to fracture, crack, and break, and shatter. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails it in one point has become guilty of it all. We have broken the law of God through some of the sins listed here. So does this mean for us that the end of verse 21 will be our fate? I know you caught it in the public reading of the scripture. It is haunting. It is sobering. I warn you as I warned you before. In other words, Paul said, I told you this. I'm telling you this again, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let those words seep in your heart for a moment. So if I do these things, then I don't inherit the kingdom of God. That's true. Because all of us here have been in that spot. Some of us are no longer in that spot. And some of us here today are in that spot. You are either going to inherit the kingdom of God or you are not. So what about us? If we claim to be in Christ, but we do such things that are listed here, what does that mean? Well, the word do in verse 21 was written in the same present tense imperative that the word walk was in verse 16. So think about this. It's not just a one-time thing. It's doing regularly, continually, habitually. In other words, it's your walk. These sins define your walk. These sins are the ones that you consistently follow. And let me tell you this, if you can habitually live in these areas and commit them with no guilt, no remorse, no sadness, no repentance, you're not in the faith. Somebody cannot live all out in these sins and be characterized by them and be followers of Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. See, an unsaved person, they don't know this battle because the Spirit of God does not live within them. He has not conquered the capital city of their heart. And we cannot, no matter what we do, restrain the flesh without the Spirit. So if you're sitting here this morning and you say, I'm struggling with sin. I claim to follow Christ, but I am struggling with sin. Let me just encourage you, that's not a bad thing because you recognize the war that is within you and you are fighting it. You are pushing back against the darkness because the faithful Christian can and will win these battles by verse 24. Look at that with me. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, they've done what? Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The faithful Christian crucifies the flesh. John Owen said, you better be killing sin or it'll be killing you. We must be killing sin. Write this down. Right under where I asked you to write down, submit to the Spirit. Starve out sin. We must starve the sin in our lives. We must starve the flesh. We must kill it. Romans chapter 13, verse 14, Paul says, make no provision for the flesh. We must remember that the spirit and the flesh have different appetites. They desire different things. And whichever one you feed the most in your life, that's what's going to grow. So what area of your life this morning do you need to starve out? What do you need to kill out? What do you need to crucify in your life, in your flesh? See, when we choose these fleeting fleshly pleasures, we miss out on what we see next in the text, what could be lasting fruit. See, the faithful Christian consistently follows. The faithful Christian crucifies the flesh. But thirdly, the faithful Christian cultivates fruit. You know, fruit is a metaphor in Scripture to describe the conduct of us as believers. And due to that, we often think fruit works. Well, rightly so, but it's more than just Works, And the reason I say that is a person can do so many external works in the flesh. The old nature 
is really, really good at counterfeiting fake fruit to make you think you're okay. It's like you come into the house and you decide that you want an apple and you walk to the table and you see a bowl of apples and you pick one up only to realize that it's a plastic waxy apple that you can't eat. That's a work of the flesh. The flesh cannot produce real fruit. The flesh only produces works. What I mean by that is you can come and you can give and that can be done in the flesh. You can sit in this pew and listen and take notes and sing. That can be done in the flesh. You can help someone out and serve someone in the flesh. I can stand here and preach this message today, and we all have to fight against this if we ever fill a pulpit in the flesh. So the point is simply doing these externals. And if you gauge your life by that way, well, I'm doing these things, so I must be okay with God. Not necessarily so. The Pharisees were masters at doing the external at the expense of the internal. Just read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We first have to understand that cultivating fruit begins as an internal work before it becomes externally evident. Thus, in verses 22 and 23, we see the most popular part of this passage, the fruit of the Spirit. And there's nine qualities listed here. And just like with the sins of the flesh, the deeds and the works of the flesh, we won't have time to go through all of these either. But I do want you to notice that each one of these are first inwardly focused. They're an attitude first that gives birth to an action. Just like as if you were to plant, you take the seeds, you dig a hole in the ground and you drop them in before they grow and sprout out of the ground. These are fruit that the Holy Spirit plants in your heart, and then they sprout and come out of you externally, but not before they begin internally. The idea here is being before doing. Now back up just for a moment so we don't get too technical, but we need to see this. In verse 19, notice it says works, not work. In verse 19, that is a plural word, not a singular word. And the reason is this, as we talked about, you're not going to do all the works of this flesh at one time. We're going to pick and choose the sin that we have the most proclivity to. We're going to pick and choose the one that we want to do the most. And so we see Paul listing here the works of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. These characterize the lost. And right here, Paul draws a very clear line in the sand and then gives us the fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23, which do not characterize the lost, but characterize the saved. So that's verse 19. You see works, not work. But look at verse 22. It's singular, not plural. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It is fruit of the Spirit. Now, why is that so? Because you cannot pick and choose this fruit like we can pick and choose our sin. These nine qualities are so interconnected in a person's life who is walking by the Spirit that they cannot be produced in isolation from one another. It's not like, oh, kindness is an apple, and goodness is a pear, and self-control is an orange, and I put these all in a basket together. No, it's more like it's a bunch of grapes or bananas. They are interconnected together. And we see the first one is love. And love is listed first because it's out of love that all of these others are produced. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So how do we get this fruit? We cultivate our lives to bear it. See, fruit just doesn't grow. The conditions must be right for fruit to grow. They must be ripe for fruit to grow. I can't go in my backyard this afternoon and plant pineapples and lemons and kiwi and oranges and limes because we don't live in an environment to be able to support citrus fruit that way. And if you're not cultivating an environment of your life, fruit is not going to grow because the Holy Spirit Even though we have all of him that we ever need, he needs more of us to do his best work. And he doesn't work in a vacuum. He works through means. Let me tell you, there's no fancy way to do this. There's no secret field somewhere in which to produce this fruit. There's no secret fertilizer. It's the steady use of what God has given you. The Bible, prayer, and the church. Seems too simple, right? It's got to be something else. It's got to be something more mystical, something more fanatic than that. No, no. The Bible, prayer, and the church, what's been called historically within the church, the ordinary, the necessary means of grace. You think about planting, you break the ground, you drop in the seed, you cover it up, you water it, and you put sunshine on it, and then you trust the Lord to do what you can't do, make that seed grow. 
And it's the same thing. We sincerely come to the word and prayer and gather with the people of God. We do the possible and then we trust God to do the impossible, which is to bear the fruit. Take a moment to walk the fields of your heart. Just walk the orchards of your life. Inspect the fruit that's there. You have a basket in your hand. It's time for the harvest. And you go picking fruit. And you come out of the field. You come out of the orchard. What do you see? Just like every believer, as we talked about earlier, under consistently following, they're going to be taking steps in their life, some greater than others, sometimes more than others. It's the same way with fruit. You will be bearing fruit if you are indeed in the faith, if you have indeed believed and repented of your sins. And some of you this morning, you've bore some big crops. Right now might be a pretty sparse season, but nonetheless, you're producing some fruit. And if you're here and you claim to be connected to the Lord Jesus and you have borne no fruit in your life, you may have a bad root this morning that we need to look at. John chapter 15, verse 5, one of the most encouraging passages of Scripture to me, particularly in the ministry, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. We are to bear fruit, but we must recognize we cannot do that on our own. On our own, we're like an apple tree where the branch has been cut off and dropped next to the tree. And then we go out a month later and we look for apples on that branch and we realize there are none because it's not connected. We cannot do this by ourselves. And if we stay connected to him like a branch to a tree, we're going to do exactly what we were created to do bear fruit. It's a natural outpouring of being with the Lord. You bear fruit. And one of the best ways to do this, write this down with submission of the Spirit and starving out your sin, is saturate yourself with the Scriptures. You saturate the ground to make plants grow. You saturate your heart with the Word of God so that fruit can grow. John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says in his prayer for the disciples and by extension us, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The Bible is sharp. It's a sword. In the armor of God, it is the offensive weapon. And since it is so sharp, God will use his word to prune the things in our life that does not need to be there. Why? Because it will make us fertile to produce the fruit that he desires us to bear. So as we close this morning, We must remember the faithful Christian consistently follows. The faithful Christian crucifies the flesh and the faithful Christian cultivates fruit. And this is daily happening in the life of a believer. And the simplest way to begin this is to do these things daily. Submit to the spirit, starve out sin and saturate yourself with scripture. I wanna share with you an excerpt that I found in a commentary on my shelf. And as I look at this, it's from the Pilgrim's Progress. And I'm not sure if you've ever read that. It may not be the easiest read for some, but it was written hundreds of years ago by John Bunyan. And it's an allegory of the Christian life. And it's absolutely incredible. And I refreshed myself with it a couple of months ago on a trip. But listen to this. In Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan describes Interpreter's House which Pilgrim entered during the course of his journey to the celestial city. The parlor of the house was completely covered with dust. And when a man took a broom and started to sweep, he and the others in the room began to choke from the great clouds of dust that were stirred up. The more vigorously he swept, the more suffocating the dust became. Then interpreter ordered a maid to sprinkle the room with water with which the dust was quickly washed away. Now listen to this. Interpreter in the story explained to Pilgrim that the parlor represented the heart of an unsaved man. The dust was his original sin. The man with the broom was the law and the maid with the water was the gospel. His point was all the law can do is stir up sin. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can wash it away. And that's the theme of Galatians. And that's the crossroads we find ourselves this morning in our text